I want to continue tonight our exhortations to faith. We've looked at the search for faith, how Christ is going to be looking for it when he returns, and how that faith dares to succeed and not fail. Looked at faith in the will of God and saw that we can't exercise faith unless we know the will of God. That ought to be obvious, but often it's overlooked. And last time, faith was the antidote to fear and worry. Tonight, faith, the cure for negative thinking. Faith is the cure for negative thinking. Now, since most people are involved, even positive thinkers, in some form of negative thinking along the way, we need all the instruction we can get. I'm sure you believe that. I know I do about how to overcome or cure negative thinking. I found over the years you can classify everyone into one of three groups, the positive thinkers, the negative thinkers, and the no thinkers. <laughs> now the no thinkers we can deal with first and get out of the way. The no thinkers range all the way from college students to hippies who go about seeking their identity, who they are, want to know who they are, want to find themselves. And sometimes they drop out of society, hitchhike out to Arizona, where they can meditate on the desert and look up at stars at night and try to discover who they are as so they smoke pot. <laughs> and many of them, when they find out who they really are, decide the search wasn't worth the effort. <laughs> And so they try to lose themselves then in yoga and TM and Eastern religions so they can be absorbed back into the cosmic soul of the universe. Well, since the no-thinkers have, for the most part at least, removed themselves from the range of truth since they think they've already found it in Eastern religion or whatever, then I want to center our attention on those of us who are still reachable, and that is the positive thinkers who sometimes think negatively, as well as negative thinkers who need to learn how to think positively, if there are any of those with us tonight. Most people are negative thinkers. Now, I want to deal, first of all, with some fallacies about positive thinking, and then deal with some characteristics of negative thinking to enable us to get rid of that, if that's what we're guilty of. Some fallacies about positive thinking, first of all. The first fallacy I'd like to mention is the fallacy that positive thinking is merely the absence of negative thinking. Now, that's a fallacy, a mistake. And, of course, most of you know we do have a book entitled Positive Thinking and Confession. We're not going to be dealing with that, but if you didn't know that, there's something available that you can take home and put into practice. But the first fallacy is thinking that positive thinking is merely the absence of negative thinking. And that isn't true because you've got to fill your mind and heart with the Word of God in order to be a positive thinker in the scriptural sense. You've got to base your thinking on the Word of God, what God has said, His promises, His Word, because you can have a positive attitude and still not be positive scripturally. And I'll show you how that's true with some examples. First of all, there is a school of philosophy called positivism. And this school of philosophy is based upon the idea of following only sense evidence, listening only to the so-called scientific facts, things you can prove, data that you can demonstrate is factual because it's provable. The positivist school rejects any speculation whatsoever or any belief based upon faith alone. Well, you can see already that there are people who are positivists, but philosophical positivism is not scriptural positivism because we're quite positive when we believe for something God has promised before we see it yet. Mark eleven twenty four. Believe you have it and you'll have it. And then there are the social positivists, political, educational positivists, religious, and we can demonstrate that none of these are scripturally positive, even the religious oftentimes. 
they all follow the principle that you're to get everyone involved in whatever they want to be positive about. Get them involved, get everyone to cooperate. So if it's social positivism, then you're supposed to get everyone in the community to participate in social welfare, that is, social projects. All the fun drives and so forth are to save the oak trees on Main Street <laughs> movement that they're thinking about cutting them down. Social issues are to join in the march and the petition against the local industry that's supposed to be polluting the lakes and the streams with chemicals. I never see any of these social positivists who are always demonstrating against that, demonstrating, marching against the doctor's offices or the hospitals who are polluting their bodies with all these drugs. To say nothing of the pollution they're doing to their own bodies by smoking pot and whatever. Then there are the political positivists. Get everyone out to vote. Get involved in political activity and so forth. Or the educational positivists. Remember, they're motivated by one theme, get everyone involved in whatever they're involved in. The educational positivists get all the parents involved in PTA, our progressive education, and so on. The religious positivists, and you see none of this has anything to do with scriptural positivism. Religious are stressing, get everyone to go to church, the church of their choice on Sunday. Failing in that, at least get them out to an Easter sunrise service or some religious observance or to participate in the daily vacation Bible school, or the ecumenical movement. You know, that's an attempt to get everyone involved. And then there's another category like the gurus and their disciples, the flower children, who have this positive dream of a world without war, where peace and love prevail and no one has to work. They're the ones always wanting to destroy the establishment, but you know, as I've said, that if they ever succeed in that, then who's going to support them with the welfare that they're living off of? If you tear down the establishment, you know, they live off of welfare, most of them, and so who's going to support them? And so here's a fallacy in thinking that positive thinking is simply the absence of negative thinking. All of these people are quite positive. You could make up a list but it has nothing to do with scriptural positivism. Another fallacy I'd like to mention is the fallacy concerning positive thinking. The fallacy that positive thinking is sometimes confused with the power of concentration. You know, if you just concentrate hard enough on an object, you'll get it. Positive thinking sometimes is confused with the power of concentration and are the repetition of certain mottos, our principles, our scriptural promises, our verses. In other words, if I have a need, let's say of a job, or of a husband or a wife, or a healing, or whatever, and I find a promise in the Word, if I just concentrate hard enough on that object, and don't allow any negative thoughts to enter my mind, and if it's a job I need, and if I just repeat Matthew 6.33 often enough, then eventually I will set in motion certain mysterious powers in the universe that will begin to operate on that need or desire, and it will be drawn to me just like a piece of iron drawn to a magnet. To give you an example, let's say it's a job you need, and you've applied six times down at the contractor's office, and he said no every time. But if you just concentrate hard enough and repeat Matthew 6.33, where God promises to supply your material needs if you have faith, if I just repeat that long enough, then one day he's going to suddenly look up from his blueprints with a puzzled look on his face. And then the light will go on, and he'll rush over the phone. Joe Brown, that's you. Yes. Are you the one that applied six times for the job down here, you know, wheeling bricks and things around? And I said, no, every time. You say, yes. Well, he said, I want you to come to work in the morning as my foreman, starting salary 35000 a year, three weeks paid vacation and use of the company vehicle, and you don't have to come to work if it rains or if you don't feel like it. Well, it'll never happen any more than if you go out at night and wish upon the first star you see. Which, of course, you don't do, but a lot of people do, or make a wish when you blow out the candles on a birthday cake, which I hope you're delivered from also. 
So positive thinking is not to be confused with the power of concentration. Now you've got to build a faith image in your mind and heart. We've got teaching on that. We're trying to show some errors about positive thinking that people sometimes don't understand why they don't get an answer to prayer because they've concentrated hard enough and they've determined to think positive thoughts and no negative thoughts about it. And they've repeated Matthew 6.33 like a Roman Catholic going over his rosary and still nothing happens. Well, that isn't positive thinking. Positive thinking is Philippians 4.8 in time of trial. It's Philippians 4.8 in time of persecution. It's Philippians 4.8 when you've prayed about a matter and you're waiting on the answer. Or in your day-to-day -day activities. Do we have to turn there in this church? I hope not. Philippians 4.8. Whatsoever things are true and just and honest and lovely and pure and of a good report, think on these things when you're going through a trial or after you've claimed a promise. That's positive thinking. It isn't the power of concentration. Now, I'll just parenthetically say it's on some of the tapes. If you don't have a positive image in your mind of seeing the answer already come to you, although it isn't manifested yet, you probably won't get it. But you see, after we said that, it's not just the power of concentration, how hard we concentrate, but it's staying with these positive thoughts in our mind about it, not allowing the negative to come in. Positive thinking is avoiding negative thoughts and confessions like you hear out of everyone. I recently read of a woman, and she was simply remarking about how that when you get married you might as well expect it when the children come along you're going to spend a lot of time in the hospital with your children with cut lips and broken bones and so on and then they wonder why they experience these things but everyone talks this way everyone from the butcher to the baker and if any of those here tonight it's just a figure of speech but it's true anyway are the missionaries over in vietnam during the time that the soldiers in the war was over there I was reading a story about their lives and experiences. Because they're non-charismatic and because they've not been taught anything, the communists, by the way, began to infiltrate and then come farther and farther into the territory in the south and began to capture missionaries, oh, I guess several hundred over there, and kill some of them. And some of them never returned. And when this was happening, and right in a period of crisis, some of the missionaries fell on their knees and prayed and listened. I mean, it's pathetic. Lord, we don't ask you to deliver us from the communists, that you just give us the grace to bear whatever comes. Now compare that with David in the Psalms, who is constantly over and over crying out to God to deliver him and to protect him, like from Saul and his own son Absalom and the enemies. Or compare that prayer with Psalm 91. I'm not going to fall on my knees and say, Lord, I don't ask you to deliver me. I ask him every day and thank him every day. And say, just give me the grace to bear it, like Paul in his so-called thorn of eye disease or whatever. It's pathetic. And so it's staying positive. It isn't accepting everything that comes along as if it's fate. A third fallacy is the fallacy of trying to add, quote, some positive actions, unquote, in the form of help to your positive thinking after you pray in order to ensure that you get an answer. Another fallacy is trying to add some positive works to your positive thinking. Positive works in the form of help. Now again, we have to keep a balance because we know and we teach what the Bible says, that faith without works is dead. Now we all know that, so we can move on. But on the other hand, it is not faith to begin to help God answer your prayers, thinking that it's not enough to think positively. You must also do something positive in the form of help. Now, God doesn't need your help. He needs your faith. And you have to distinguish between acting your faith, of course, and helping God. Like the little girl I read about who discovered she was about seven years of age, she discovered her brother, who was a couple of years older, was building rabbit traps to catch all of those little bunnies that she and her little friend next door loved to feed lettuce leaves to and watch them play around the yard. 
And she discovered her mean old brother was building rabbit traps, you know, a little framework with chicken wire. And I won't go into the explanation how they catch them, but she was telling her girlfriend about it, that her brother was going to try to trap their little pets, their rabbits. They were wild, but they fed them and so on. And she said, what'd you do? She said, I prayed that he wouldn't catch any of those rabbits. Anything else? Yes, I prayed that God wouldn't let any of those rabbits get in the trap. Did you do anything else? Yes, she said, then I went out and I kicked those rabbit traps into a million pieces. <laughs> so you see, while God wants your faith to produce works, he doesn't need help. It's one thing to see that faith without works is dead. It's another thing if you see that works without faith is also dead. If you are believing you're healed after prayer, then why would you take medicine? When I believe God for the heart condition, I threw the medicine away. That's acting your faith, by the way. If you've claimed a job, then you act your faith by going out and filling in some applications, not sitting waiting for this man to look up from his blueprints and the light goes on and he calls you and offers you this dream of a job. If it is a vacation that you don't have the money for, make your plans to take it if you claim the money. See, there's a difference between acting your faith like that and the person who prayed for rain but didn't take an umbrella. See, that isn't acting your faith. You pray for rain, take an umbrella. If you pray that the rain will stop, leave your umbrella at home. Or there's a difference between acting your faith and say, keep calling that fellow that said no six times. Keep calling the company where you put in your application or writing them a series of letters to let them know you're still available for that job that they've already said no about. You see, they will look upon you as a positive pest, not as a positive thinker if you keep bothering them. I mean, I would be bothered by a person like that if they were applying for a job. Or if it's a matter of healing, you're not acting your faith when you do a some do, and if it isn't manifested in three or four days or weeks, you go to the doctor to have all of these tests run and checkups so, quote, you'll know how to pray, unquote. That's the best way I know for the devil to move in and put on you whatever the doctor said you have. A fourth fallacy is the converse of what we just said. God doesn't want your help. Faith does act, but he doesn't want your help. Conversely, the fallacy of thinking that's all that's required after you pray is to keep a positive attitude. You just sit back with a positive attitude and everything will work out. Now that's a fallacy because prayer which receives an answer must meet certain conditions. We know that here but it needs to be said. We need to be reminded of it. Now, positive thinking and confession, of course, is one of the conditions, but there are other conditions that have to be met, not just thinking positively. There have been people who think positively, but they won't go out and look for a job. They think positively. Somebody's going to leave money on their car seat or bring groceries to the home or whatever. And, of course, those things have happened and do happen, and we have no criticism of that. We're talking about those who think that all they have to do is think positively. But there are conditions like pray the prayer of faith, Matthew 21, 22. Pray according to the will of God, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. You see, there are just some things, you might as well face it, that doesn't matter how positive an attitude you keep, you would never get an answer in a thousand years because it's not God's will. He isn't going to answer a prayer that's not his will, or if you're not meeting conditions. It's like the little boy that was saying his bedtime prayers, and he closed the prayer with saying, and God, please make Boston the state capital of Ohio. <laughs> his mother overheard it and said, Boston, the state capital of Ohio. She said, what did you pray for that? He said, because that's what I put on my geography test today. Well, you've heard prayers change things, but prayer won't change the geography. You can just be as positive as you want and pray and pray. There are just some things that you'll never get an answer to, no matter how positive you pray and believe any more than saying you believe in Santa Claus will get you that doll or the bicycle. Or saying you believe in the tooth fairy will get you a quarter under your pillow for that tooth that you placed there after you pulled it. For those who've never heard, and I don't suppose there's any here, but these tapes go everywhere. There isn't any Santa Claus. That's your daddy, and the tooth fairy is your mother. 
And so there's some things it doesn't matter how positive you believe it. I remember back when I was about seven, I really tried to believe and stay positive, believe in Santa Claus. That was back during the Depression, and I didn't get a thing. All the belief in the world and all the positive thinking in the world. I didn't think there was one, but I wanted to believe it so badly to get something that uh, I tried. But you see, it doesn't matter how positive you are. Just positive thinking by itself, if it doesn't line up with the will of God, isn't going to get you anything. I mean, a positive attitude is necessary. But if what you request doesn't line up with the word, you know the answer to that from the faith teaching. Another fallacy, before we get to the negative, about positive thinking is again a familiar area that you should keep a positive attitude by thanking God even if he says no to your prayer or sends a substitute. This is the old delusion that is so popular among charismatics and non-charismatics alike that you should thank God for everything. Now the Bible doesn't teach that. That's a popular fallacy that has no basis in Scripture. Thank God for the divorce you're taught. Thank God for your son jumping out of the tenth story window on drugs. Thank God for the sickness or the cancer or the terminal illness. That makes no sense. That isn't Bible. We are to thank God in everything, Paul says. Now, we've already taught on this, but I'm stressing the idea that if you remain positive, then if God says no or sends a substitute, you see, and you remain positive, why then you're pleasing to God. But the Bible doesn't teach that. God does not say no to prayer, not based on his promises. We have all the teaching already on that, so we're not going to labor the point. 1 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of God are already yes in Christ Jesus. So how could he say no if he said yes? Now we have to meet the conditions to make the yes apply to us. And he certainly doesn't send substitutes because we have another passage, Luke 11, 9 to 13. He said, if you ask bread, he won't give you a stone. If you ask for an egg, he won't give you a scorpion. You'll get what you ask for. So an answer to prayer is receiving the exact thing promised and the exact thing requested by you, or it isn't an answer. How could God say no if he said yes? You see, God just plain does not answer you if you don't meet the conditions. That isn't a no, it's just God not answering. Because when he answers you, he says yes. The answer is always yes, because he said it, I didn't. All the promises of God are already yes in Christ Jesus. Yes and amen. So this popular notion that God knows best and he says no or sends substitutes has no scripture to support it. Certainly God knows best. That's why he made us these precious promises of healing, providing for our needs, protection and deliverance. And that's why he requires faith to receive those things. Yes, he knows best. And so he set up the conditions to get them. What is a substitute anyway? A substitute is not the answer. And we're always hearing the denominationals as well as charismatics for the most part talking about the substitute that they took because God knew best. The substitute is God providing you the money to buy a hearing aid when you've prayed for the healing of your ears. You see, that would be a substitute. That's not an answer to prayer. It would be when you've claimed a home paid for, someone coming along with that attractive offer, and it happens, not infrequently, of selling you a home on land contract, where you have to sign your name and get bound up, sometimes unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, a land contract is not an answer to prayer if you've claimed a house paid for. Even if they say $50 down payment, no down payment, pay it off like rent. I bought a house that way one time. But that was before I stopped leasing and doing these sort of things, signing my name to anything. If it's faith, if it's a faith walk, then God will provide for you amen. what it is you believe for. Two amens and a few sighs. But he will. So what is a substitute? A substitute is that free old car that won't start half the time when you've claimed a new one. But you see, the temptation is, and more than one in this body has done that, to take the old car. That's the answer. I say more than one in this body, more than one that I've uh, heard of. 
in this ministry? That isn't an answer. When the little children asked their daddy, there were eight of them in the family, for one of those little toy dogs. You know, I mean a live dog, but a puppy that never grows up. It's not really a dog. <laughs> those little things about eight inches long. And so he promised them a dog, and he didn't have but $10, and he knew he couldn't buy a dog for $10. He went down to the dog pound. Well, he was trying to find if there was anything there for $10, 5 or $10. There he saw a German shepherd someone hadn't claimed, and then a dachshund, you know, the long jobs. <laughs> so he bought that, and when he brought it home, the kitty said, Well, Daddy, we wanted that little toy dog, those little tiny puppies that never grow up. He said... You know, I got to thinking, if you got one of those, he wouldn't last a week, the way you kids roughhouse and pass him back and forth and fall on him and roll over on him. He wouldn't have lasted a week. Well, they said, why did you get a dachshund? He said, well, with a dachshund, all of you can pet him at once. <laughs> well, they got a dog, but they didn't get an answer. See, that wasn't an answer to their prayer. That was a substitute. Whatever his logic was, see, he knew best. This whole idea God knows best. He sure does. But he doesn't give dachshunds for excuses for dogs, if that's what you want. <laughs> now let's come to the second division in our study tonight. Those are some fallacies. Certainly there are others about positive thinking. I'd like to come now to some characteristics of negative thinking that you may need to cure yourself about. Some characteristics of negative thinking. Now, a lot of the things we'll mention will fit the world in general, but it also fits the people in the church. It'll also include maybe some here. A lot of general clues and facts symptomatic of being a negative person. Now, you're a negative person if at the first sign of a symptom you begin to confess you've got the sickness. And friends, the temptation comes to all of us. There it is again. I thought I was rid of that thing and battled it for two weeks, and now I seem to have the symptoms again. Well, don't confess them, or you'll possess them. Now, that's a common thing here. We know that, that people began to confess their symptoms instead of the Word of God. You're a negative person. If you believe, you'll fail. You say, well, I'm not going to try that. There's no use. I'd fail if I tried. A negative person talks that way. You're negative if you get nervous when you succeed at anything. Oh, yes. Have you ever heard anyone say when they succeed, I don't believe it. Have you ever said that? Come on now. You didn't expect to succeed, or you didn't expect that it would work. And you got nervous when you failed to fail. You get tense when you don't have to do everything twice, that it works the first time. You say, I don't believe it, it worked the first time. Well, that's a negative person. A negative person, again, isn't really happy in being happy. They don't expect, you know, things to be rosy seven days a week, 365 days a year, and they feel better when the waitress goofs on the order. That is, she leaves the bacon off the bacon, lettuce, tomato sandwich, because that's what they expect. That's normal for the negative person. If everything went right, they wouldn't be able to believe it. They'd say, I don't believe it. This good service. The negative person isn't happy unless it rains on the day they plan the picnic because that's what they're looking for. The negative person runs out of gas on the way to his best friend's wedding. He feels better about that than if he got there. A negative person is one who is afraid to make a decision, afraid to make a choice because they may be wrong, afraid to commit themselves. Are you afraid to commit yourself about this or that or the other, as unstable as a windshield wiper back and forth? There's some people that can't make a decision. They don't want to make a decision. They don't want to commit themselves. That results because they're negative, basically negative. Because if you were positive, you would say, here's what I believe, or here's what I want to do. Have you ever asked anyone a question, they answer you with a question? Oh, I'll tell you, I have to overcome on that one. You think about that for a moment. You ask a question and you get a question in reply. 
Just to use an example, it wouldn't happen in your house or my house, but I say to my wife, I'm out of toothpaste. And she answers, you mean there's no toothpaste? <laughs> well, I just said that. I'm expecting a better answer than that. It's like the two men who were riding on the bus and the negative person was on his left and the man he was riding with was looking out the window and they passed a big farm with a lot of sheep out there. And he said, look, the farmer has sheared his sheep. And the negative person said, well, at least he has on this side. <laughs> but it isn't an attempt just to be humorous, but the fact is that a negative person will never commit themselves. He wouldn't commit himself. He could see they were sheared on the side that he was looking at. The negative person comes to church early so he can get a back seat <laughs> and no one will notice him. Now that's true. There are people who come early enough to get a back seat. You better believe it. Now I'm not talking about people with babies. I'm just trying to make a point. The negative person is a person who says his favorite holiday is Labor Day because then he doesn't have to buy anyone a present. He doesn't have to go anywhere, see anyone, or support any cause. Again, the negative person, as I say, this generally fits the world, but it includes the church. The negative person is a person that nothing goes right for him or her because they don't expect it. He finds that when he gets his new modern furniture paid for, by the time he does, it's become antique, and he doesn't like antiques. He finds that at 40, medically speaking, he's at the worst time of his life, at the age 40, because when he feels run down, he says, I'm too old for castor oil and too young for Geritol. <laughs> he's a man who says no to anything that's different or new, because it just may not work. Do you find yourself saying, we'll just pause on this one for a moment, do you find yourself saying no much of the time? You're a negative person, or either you're dumb. You know, a person asks you something and you shake your head you don't know. Now, it may be that you don't know anything. That's why you say no. But if you're saying no to everything, you're negative. Why men are married to women. I guess women are more guilty of this than men. Men are married to women that say no to everything. Right away they'll say no until he can talk her into it. Whether it's take a vacation, if you want to go up in Canada, well, oh my, it's the worst part of the year because they get snowstorms in the mountains. Or if you want to go to Germany, this is the time of the year it rains. The rivers flood. Whatever you want to do, no, because it may not work. Well, a chronic worrier, again, is a person who's afraid and anxious. A chronic worrier worries about things when there's no basis to worry. Like a hypochondriac is a person who worries about his or her health. They believe they have everything wrong with them that's in the medical books. And all you have to do is mention a symptom or a disease and they're sure to have it. A chronic worrier is one who worries about the economy or inflation and thinks a person that doesn't worry about it must either be uninformed or in the cemetery. <laughs> Another area, a negative individual is one when he or she gets married expects to follow the Hollywood syndrome. They think their marriage is going to turn out like Hollywood, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I read somewhere a Hollywood marriage is when the boy grows up and marries the girl next door, and then the girl next door to her, and the girl next door. <laughs> marriage, divorce, and remarriage. But a lot of people who are negative, when they get married, they expect to follow the soap opera syndrome of trouble and strife every day, or the Hollywood syndrome. And they quarrel over money or they quarrel over other matters. But being negative, there's no way for the marriage to work. You see, marriage is based upon mutual love. And sometimes that is interpreted to mean she loves herself, he loves himself. You know, love one another, they do, they love themselves. 
or they get to quarreling about money. Now, according to the surveys and statistics, probably the single greatest cause of divorce and trouble in marriage is finances. And people get to quarreling over that. Wives expect their husbands to give them more than maybe they're getting or for him to have more income. Well, you can read about that in the sociological books, but suspicion and things of this nature wreck marriage. And people who are negative are suspicious. And again, while sometimes husbands are jealous of wives, yet suspicion seems to operate often in the wife's mind. Her husband is away and whatever, and he finds that if he buys her flowers for no reason, he better have one because she'll begin to wonder what he's been up to to bring flowers home if it isn't, you know, an anniversary or something. And then a negative person again is a person who always believes the worst. A person who believes the worst. And the result of that is negative attitudes, criticism, and gossip. Have you ever talked to anyone? The first thing when you mention someone else or someone's ministry, someone's business, someone's job, or the neighbor, whatever, they come back with a negative response. First of all, it's negative. And so you're talking to a negative person. Now the point is, do you do that? You see, a negative person looks for the worst in others, and they fail to see sometimes the fault is in themselves. Like the little story, of course, it's to illustrate, of the mother looking out the window. Her little daughter was by her side and said to her, said, look how dirty and gray the neighbor's wash is out there on the line. And the little girl pointed out, mother, it isn't her wash, it's your window that you're looking through that hadn't been washed. And that's the way it is with negative people. Often the fault lies with them. Like the neighborhood gossip. A negative person, as I said, becomes critical of others and gossips. And a negative person said to another that had something good to tell the one they were talking to, that she'd heard this from a reliable source. And the reply was, well, why would that person want to tell you that, you know, real intimate bit of gossip she was going to gossip about. And you know, indeed that is true. Why should anyone want to tell the gossip what they say they're getting from a reliable source? Like they may say, well, I got it from the bookkeeper. So let me tell you what he said about his employer. Now the first question you ought to ask them is, why would the bookkeeper want to tell a gossip some gossip that would jeopardize his job? You ought to think about that. And people are always criticizing and whispering, and it's still in this church, friends. You ought to ask them, when they're getting some of this gossip from someone, ask them, why would they want to tell you that? You're implying, who are you that they would want to jeopardize being put out of the church or out of the job or whatever? And I say, indeed, why should they? Until they can satisfactorily answer why anyone would want to tell them that to begin with, then don't listen to them. But, of course, people like to listen to gossip. But you'll find in the case of the negative black clouds that just seeing a thing in print or just hearing it is enough confirmation for them to think that it's true and want to repeat it. Just seeing it in print, for example, is what causes, well, whether it's this state or all over the United States, now that we're getting nationwide coverage on television and so forth, it's enough for them to just to say it or to put it down in print, newsprint or a magazine for most people to believe that's true. And that fails to take into account that the media exists to slander. They wouldn't know what to do if they didn't have anything to slander someone about. And they don't care whether they destroy lives or businesses or churches or whatever. If it'll just sell those polluted papers and those rag mags that's all they're interested in. And so because you see it in print doesn't make it true. I hope you're not that gullible. You might see in print in a textbook that man evolved from apes and lower forms of life. That doesn't make it true just because it's in print. But anyway, critics and gossips can never keep a secret, so you shouldn't be talking to them anyway about anything. Like the woman who said, well, I've got something very important to tell you. Remember, gossips to you will gossip about you to somebody else. They can't keep a secret. So he said, I've got something important to tell you, and I want you to listen carefully because I can't repeat it. I can only tell it once. 
And she said, why can you only tell it once? Because I promised the one that told me I wouldn't repeat it. <laughs> but the person who tells you that, of course, means don't tell anybody. But listen carefully, I can only say it once. A gossip can't keep a secret. You know, when we were growing up, we were taught never to speak with our mouths full, our heads empty. And if there's one thing that characterizes critics and gossips, and I include the media, I include the media on this, is that the greatest underdeveloped territory <laughs> lies between their two ears. <laughs> greatest underdeveloped territory that there is. You see, pessimism and negativism is contagious. Someone said you can catch it just standing too close to the six o'clock news because it's all pessimistic, it's all critical. Well, I trust that you can see there is a way to keep yourself out of negativism. Just don't get involved in all of these things that we've mentioned. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for the moving of the Holy Spirit upon our lives, controlling us as we yield to you our thoughts, what we say, our speech, our actions, that in everything we will keep a positive life. What we say, what we think, even our attitudes, that we will control what enters the mind and what goes out the lips. Because you've said in your word that even a fool, if he keeps his mouth closed, is considered wise. And so help us to measure our words and to control what we think, both in thoughts and attitudes, and to always bless our brothers and sisters, even in our minds as well as with our lips, and not to allow the enemy to implant any thought, whether it's something we've read or heard, that we will not accept it simply because we've read it or heard it, if it's negative, against a brother or sister or anyone else for that matter that we'll be in complete control of our own lives. To this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.